What a reverberating start to our morning. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. And a very warm welcome to each of you to perhaps the southernmost point of the African con continent as you begin the FIATA Congress this week. My name is Lynette Nduli, and I will be your host for this morning's opening ceremony um, as we prepare each of you, your various organizations and the member associations that you all represent this morning, um, to voyage with us on this journey of insight, of discovery, and of course, looking at various sustainable solutions converged to technologies to take the freight forwarding industry and the logistics world forward. Ladies and gentlemen, the FIATA Congress, to those of you who perhaps don't know, is the world's a premier platform for the leaders in the logistics world. Reliable sources inform me that the freight forwarding industry, the logistics in, in this maritime sector in particular, is perhaps the biggest arm of transportation on our seas and waters today. And ladies and gentlemen, each of you today sit representing not just 40,000 freight forwarding and logistics firms from around the world, but also the hopes the aspirations, the skills, as well as the progressive initiatives that will drive a forward 10 million people's livelihoods spread across 150 nations across the world. Ladies and gentlemen, today and weeks such as these are not made possible without partners without a various organizations and institutions commitments to come together and ensure that you as members of these institutions are able to connect are able to share and are able to contribute to the discourse of your various nations and organizations and um, strategies your economies and of course making sure that there is prosperity um, and growth for all within the various industries and the arms of this industry that you represent today and so before we set forward on this voyage I would just like to touch on a few matters of housekeeping this morning um, related to how the venue and our proceedings, of course, over the next few days will continue. Ladies and gentlemen, if I can please just remind everybody to keep their lanyards with their name tags on them. In that name tag, you will find a number of details related to our programs, where you should be, where you can seek help. And of course, um, take a look into some of the functions and the various meetings that happen on the periphery of this main plenary this morning. The ICC in Cape Town is also here to help you, ladies and gentlemen. And you will have already bumped into quite a number of our hosts and our assistants on the way in and out of the various um, venues. So, should you need any assistance with getting to any venues, to getting to any of the ablutions, to the parking, and to any of our help desks, ladies and gentlemen, please do approach the members of staff who are um, wearing uniform, but are also, some of them are also carrying insignia to help the FIATA delegates today. To those of you who are attending the Congress this year and will need a certificate of participation, please note that this will be sent to you at the close of our proceedings. You are also further invited, ladies and gentlemen, to use this opportunity to meaningfully and significantly connect with your fellow, um, with your fellow, fellow um, delegates and attendees at the conference. And the business-to-business -business meetings can be held in the meeting zone. Now, to those of you who haven't perhaps used it already, it is in the exhibition hall. But if you do need assistance with bookings, as well as beginning to use the technology and the application to access the various delegates and participants to our Congress, please do again approach the help desk for help. Ladies and gentlemen, the FIATA General Meeting will also take place this Saturday at half past 11 in the Ballroom West. And as many of you will already know, attendance to this event is by invitation only. 
to those of you who are using social and digital media to connect not only to your offices, to your member associations, but also to the people that you influence through the knowledge that you share on your various platforms. We encourage you over the next few days to please share your conference experience, the insights and the learning that you gain with those audiences via the various social and digital media platforms that this conference is connected to. So whether you're on Twitter, you're on Facebook, you're using a LinkedIn or any other, please just simply tag your posts with our hashtag FIATA2019 to enable that sharing and connectivity ladies and gentlemen we've made sure that there is wi-fi available to all of our guests throughout the venue and we encourage everybody to please at this point in our program to download the events app simply go to your android or apple store find the events air um, application download it and once you've installed it your event app code is FIATA2019. It will ask you to log on, to create a, a password, and then the instructions and the confirmation link will be sent to your associated email address for you to then be able to log on and catch up with what's going on at the conference for the rest of the week. We're not only on social media, but we've also arranged quite a number of social events to ensure that the sharing and the connectivity also occurs outside our formal program. Our three major social events this week are the welcome reception, later on this evening, the national evening, as well as the gala banquet. And all of these, ladies and gentlemen, are open to you if you had already pre-registered. In the event, anything has changed. You are, for instance, no longer able to attend, or you hadn't signed up and would like to please simply go to the registration and information desk and you will be assisted if spaces are available at, at these events. Ladies and gentlemen, the reception desk will also assist you with any inquiries related to the events, their venues, dress codes and uh, the like. To officially welcome us, however, this morning to the FIATA Congress for 2019 is your president, Mr. Baba Badat. Ladies and gentlemen, please give him a very warm welcome to our stage.
Ladies and gentlemen, today, as things stand, we live through very challenging times. There is major disruptions in global trade. Uh, the world's two largest trading communities or countries are challenging each other's uh, tariffs. Uh, there is the Brexit issue, uh, which is causing disruptions. And there are multiplier effects of these two things on a global level. There is protectionism, uh, there is a lot of things happening. The very existence uh, uh, and the, the premise of the World Trade Organization is being channeled, challenged also. So we are living through times where challenges are up which we have never seen before. Commercial and mercantile communities have never experienced these type of challenges. And all these challenges mean the reduction of trade. And the reduction of trade means that our business is the front line, effective in the front line, which is a big problem for our industry and for, as it is for most other trades. So we at FIATA uh, uh, give this issue due consideration. We sat, we thought, uh, our senior members, our ex-presidents, our presidency, our extended board, we all have been through a lot of um, uh, discussions on this and we decided that we are going to reset our organization. So we at FIATA have been engaged in some primary activity in trying to reset our organization and certain steps that we are taking to do that and gearing up for uh, coming times. Now in that process we have also looked at the future beyond the immediate future and looking at the younger participants. We want them to engage in this organization. We want more uh, expanse over here. Uh, when Basil is, um, is, is going to take over now in the next few days as president, and one of the things I requested him is that um, uh, you have 53 or 54 countries in Africa, right? And we have 20 countries as our members. So one of the tasks that we requested him is that he should increase the membership over here. Africa is, of course, a huge continent, and uh, there are many countries over here. There's a lot of trade going on. You've got your own unions and federations which have done very well in engaging with each other with partnerships that you've done over here. In fact, something that a lot of other countries can learn from, or areas, regions can learn from. So we are very interested, of course, that uh, we have a larger footprint in Africa uh, over here. So these are some of the challenges that we are looking at and uh, some of the areas that we are looking at, uh, education and training, uh, expansion of our uh, footprint over here, a lot of things that we are looking at will be primary and um, you will hear a lot of that in the next few days and in the coming years also you will be looking at that. So these, some of these disruptions are also creating new areas uh, of engagement and we will see new players coming in. Coupled with, with that, that the, 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 the coming up of technology. Technology, technology has played such a role, it is unbelievable. It is absolutely unbelievable what's happening. You, you've all seen the effects of the Ubers and the, um, the Airbnb, and uh, you know, that's already happened some time ago. But what you are going to see in the future, uh, uh, blockchain and all these other things, is, is unbelievable. Even the basic premise of education is changing. Education, as we all know it, um, was learning-based. If you remember, when I was young, if you took a, you were not allowed to take a calculator into an examination hall because that was considered infringement of the rules. So, all education was learning-based. Today, education is not learning-based. It's driven by internet. It's driven by information technology. So the whole premise of, of education is also changing. So you will see the way we, we, we know education, the way our children, are, uh, our older children are still uh, gone through school and colleges, that system will probably become redundant. So technology will take over that area. Similarly, um, um, uh, there are so many things happening, it's unbelievable. So every industry has to gear up for these, these changes. And if you are not ready for those changes, I think it will be detrimental to our to every sector. Um, FIATA, of course, being uh, the world's largest organization in uh, logistics and supply chain. Uh, that's what we call it now, logistics and supply chain. And instead of the conventional word of trade forwarding, many people now call it 
logistics and supply chain. So, in this industry, FIATA is the world's largest organization representing the interest of uh, 40, 50,000 companies, um, uh, 120 national associations. Um, uh, uh, we are connected with several um, uh, global organizations. We have got uh, bilateral uh, agreements with them, uh, interaction with them. So we are, we are getting up for the industry to bring it up to par to be able to handle these, uh, these uh, challenges. And um, each one of us who participates and comes to this forum, who takes the trouble and takes all the time to come to the FIATA Congresses, is part of this change and can be a greater part of this change. So I would like to request each one of you to participate in this, uh, because it's our business, it's your business, it's our industry, and this has a direct effect on global trade. Supply chain and logistics is the primary um, um, uh, prerequisite for the growth of global trade. And its um, um, uh, seamless connectivity is, is very important. A few years ago, uh, my colleagues will remember, from the platform of um, uh, the FIAT presidency, we had, uh, uh, and the board, we had issued a statement, uh, which was very profound. It was very well received in, 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 in all organizations. We had said that the biggest, and I think this was in 2012 or 13, yeah, 2013. We said that the biggest non-tariff barrier to the growth of global trade is the lack of logistics connectivity in many parts of the world. And that was, in fact, uh, 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 an observation and a problem. So we have seen since then, uh, obviously, the world is changing and uh, there has been a lot of infra uh, investment in infrastructure. But governments need to put in investment in infrastructure. The private sector, the service providers need to up their game so the seamless connectivity can function on that infrastructure. And therefore, there has to be a very good connect between the government and the associations and the trade. And it's extremely important that this connectivity goes beyond the traditional connectivity. We have to be part and parcel of policy formation. We have to be part and parcel of collective thinking for the growth of trade. And this is the, a very, very important factor. I've um, um, uh, asked my colleagues uh, in the presidency and extended board, we have emphasized this at different forums multiple times uh, to dignitaries, um, uh, to, to governments, uh, to, to people who affect change, who can actually affect change in trade and, and policy making. So um, even at the level of, 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 um, of the World Bank, Asian Development Bank, um, uh, um, Asian Infrastructure Bank, Africa Development Bank, we are connecting to these people and we, we would like to be a part of the dispensation. Where those funds are being invested for connectivity, we would like to have a, a view on that, or at least our views should be considered in that. And I think that's a very important factor for us uh, if we are to move forward. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, these are some of the thoughts that I will leave with you, and I hope um, uh, you will have some period of gestation during the rest of the, uh, of the Congress over here. And um, uh, the, the technical uh, institutions and advisory bodies will find it very interesting. For those of you who are our regular visitors, you will find it interesting. For those of you who have come for the first time, um, uh, will also find it extremely interesting. And if you have questions, there are colleagues. We are all over here. I am here. The presidency members, the extended board members, we are all here to sit and work with you. We've also got a new DG. Uh, over here, and um, uh, so all of us will be will be happy to work with you. Basil, once again, um, uh, we are absolutely delighted to be over here. Thank you so much uh, for putting this whole um, uh, fantastic uh, congress together. And um, uh, on behalf of the, um, uh, of the presidency and extended board, I'd like to thank every single person involved in this program. Uh, other, uh, in addition to our Congress Committee, everybody at the South African Association, yourself, David, everybody else over here, your teams, uh, the promoters, and also thank the sponsors who have um, uh, supported this uh, event. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, um, a very big thank you to the FIATA president this morning for his words of not only encouragement, 
but also bringing us um, to that call to action to say indeed the world is not what it used to be, business is unusual. And what role will you and I play as we watch different areas of volatility, fragility, uncertainty, all drive change technology, as well as how we bring new members, new ideas, and new thought leaders to the table. Ladies and gentlemen, to now speak um, after the president this morning is the president of the South African Association of Freight Forwarders, Mr. Basil Peterson. As he makes his way to the podium this morning, the South African Freight Forwarders Association has been a member of FIATA since 1979, but has also been in existence in its own right since 1921, and continues to serve its own members in various ways. Ladies and gentlemen, as Mr. Peterson also now stands at the podium this morning, I'm also very interested in what he will be able to tell us about this symbol that is now standing next to him. Ladies and gentlemen, please give him a very warm round of applause this morning. said, you know, and I've said, the, the only reason I've accepted this challenge is because of people like yourselves. And I really like the audience here to give all the ex-presidents and the current president a warm applause for all the hard work. Thank you. You know, the, the, the saying that says, you know, and, and I think I'll, I'll as just mentioned that there is no one that can do anything on its own. Uh, we need, we need to, to collaborate, we need to make partnerships, we need to come together, you know, to defend, to build, and to continue, you know, what we know as, as, uh, as this industry. Uh, if we do not do that, well, you know, all the hard work that we've done over many, many years would have been uh, for no particular reason. So yes, I, I think the, the numbers here in the, I think uh, yes, someone made a comment to me that uh, you must understand that they will be late because they still jet lag. Uh, but I think it is just normal. We, we tend not to get up early in the mornings as Africans. Uh, we, we, we come to work late, so anyway. So yes. Uh, what, what do you think about all those youngsters here? I, I got goosebumps uh, just watching them standing there and singing the anthem. Uh, ah, why, why? Whoever has put that together, thank you very much. Uh, I really enjoyed that very much. So, there we go on. So, honorable. Baba, the other president, as we've said. And amongst us, we also have Professor Wesley Harris. He's the head of aeronautics at Harvard University. We have in the corner on this side here, Governor, His Excellency, Mr. Ahmed al Hakbani. Welcome, sir. He's from Saudi Arabia. And with him, we have Deputy Governor Abdullah Rahman al Kakai, also from Saudi and Riyad Albani, welcome to you all. And thank you very much for, for your presence here this morning. Celeste, Priya, where is she? I haven't seen Celeste around. Anyway, I'm sure she's somewhere here. And then we've got, you know, uh, Mr. Uh, Hill Lewis, who's a parliamentarian. Welcome, sir, for gracing us with your presence here. 
Michael Yarwood, always a, a supporter of FIATA, and exactly for what the President has mentioned, the future of this, of this industry, being able to uh, constantly, year in and year out, uh, support the development of young people uh, in this industry. Thank you very much for being here and for continuing doing that. I think it's also very important for me, and, uh, and I need to say this, uh, it, is, it is our privilege and honor to welcome Dr. Edward Kisweta. Dr. Kisweta is the Commissioner for South African Revenue Services, and he will be our guest speaker. Welcome, sir. Thank you for coming. Now, I, I, have to, I have to welcome you. Uh, I believe, but I extend to you all, uh, you know, especially those who have traveled from far to join us, to share their knowledge and expertise with us. I wish you a warm South African welcome. Sawona, Orweni, Kuyadak, and good day. You all understand that? So welcome to the beautiful Cape Town. I think we've just witnessed the opening of the 58th the Outer World Congress, which received generous support from many, many corners within South Africa and from abroad, for which we are entirely grateful. Needless to state that preparation has taken us more than two years of intense hard work in putting together a program that will be challenging and which we deal with the challenges which our industry faces. It is no secret that changing industry and market dynamics throughout the world calls for strategic thinking. And I think what we have brought together here in terms of skill would give us a week, a couple of days of insight into where we're going to. Yes, our industry faces serious challenges there, all emerging from technological perspective. It might be argued that our industry has faced many such headwinds in the past, and while that might be so, this time technology, the technology, the technological onslaught is even more daunting. You would no doubt agree with me that we cannot sit back and watch our many years of extreme hard work be eroded by technology. As such, we must together encourage our members to embrace these changes and challenges, ensuring the best outcome for all. Remember, the failing of one reflects negatively on each and every one associated with this industry. With this in mind, we created a program, a Congress program, in which such challenges are highlighted and can be debated, not only on a local basis, but at an international scale. You heard the, the President mention Brexit and uh, trade barriers and all sorts of things. I think this is our, our opportunity to, to, to walk through all these. We have brought together some of the best technical skills of strategic thinkers to gauge us on the best practice norms around the world. Some of us were fortunate to attend yesterday's Young Freight Forwarders Award program. This encompasses a day dedicated to the next generation of logisticians. Continually, we must ask the all important question of what kind of legacy do we want to leave behind? It is with this in mind that FIATA insists on every host country incorporating such an event within the Congress program. We have an obligation to mentor the next generation of logisticians. Let us therefore use our collective strength proactively, for it will deliver a positive result to all. Prepare yourselves therefore to be challenged, excited, and inspired during the next few days. Members of the local organizing committee and the appointed function organizers have worked hard, and I would like to thank them for their dedication, time, and efforts throughout this period. At the same time, I would like to thank our, our patrons, individual and organization partners, and volunteers. Without the generosity here, we would not have been able to create a Congress in line with a Congress theme of where technology and logistics meet. Thank you for your presence and participation. Remember, you are the very important part of the Congress success. 
Of course, it goes without saying, you must make time to explore the beautiful city of Cape Town and its surrounding areas. It is much too often, and at times, its beauty will leave you breathless. Enjoy the Congress and enjoy your stay in Cape Town. Thank you. I was asked to comment on, on the talking stick. The tradition within, and I think it, it, it happened in, in Canada, uh, it, who was, was, who was president, Mr. Gillespie? Where is he? Let's see here. I think this was in Canada where the, the talking stick was handed over. And it was a, a, a Red Indian tribe, I'm not too sure which one it was. But it goes and it says that unless you have been given the stick, you cannot talk. And no doubt you can see why I'm talking, I've got the stick. So this stick travels around the world. At the closing of this event, over the weekend, this stick will be handed over to the next host country which will be Korea. And until such time, Korea has to be very quiet. So your time for talking will only be once you receive this. So as long as this is here, and it will remain on stage, we're all, it is my time, and it is our time here to be talking. So remember that. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you uh, very much to the host nation's president, Mr. Basil Peterson, for his words of welcome, but also explaining to us that the tribe only speaks when you are in possession of the talking stick. Thank you very much, sir, for your words this morning. And congratulations to the South African team that has made sure that you and I will be able to enjoy a week of um, insights, a week of knowledge, and a week of the very best in minds in the supply chain and logistics industry from right the way across the world. Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker this morning to deliver our keynote address is a man who is no stranger to high seas in our economy at least, the Commissioner of the South African Revenue Services, Dr. Edward Kiesvetter. He has returned to serve as the Commissioner of our Revenue Services as of the 1st of May this year, having previously served at the Revenue Services between 2004 and 2009 in various executive roles um, in that particular institution. He's taken a number of breaks, but has also seen a great many things as a Chief Executive in our financial services market and continues to serve as a non-executive director on a number of boards um, across various sectors in South Africa and both our public as well as in our private sector. Well, Dr. Kisveta, if you can please make your way to the stage, and while he does, ladies and gentlemen, please give him a very warm round of applause. Good morning. I hope you're all well. And uh, they say that uh, some people get up at 6 o'clock but only wake up at 10 o'clock. So I hope that you're all up and awake. Um, members and leadership of FIATA and SAF, representatives of the freight forwarding and logistics firms around the globe, my fellow customs and government colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. And welcome to the FIATA World Congress 2019. Welcome also to the beautiful and magical Cape Town, our mother city, and I'm proud to say also the city of my birth. A special acknowledgement, now that deserves a, a, a special acknowledgement to the FIATA Global President, Mr. Babar Bidat. Uh, thank you for your address this morning, sir. Uh, as well as the South uh, Chair, Mr. Basil Peterson, 
um, and Mr. Dave Logan, the Chief Executive. Thank you for including us in this event. It is my privilege to share my thoughts with you, a global audience this morning. Uh, whilst I will draw on our own experiences, uh, I would hasten to add that what we experience would be no different to the challenges and opportunities that each of you in your domestic economies are facing. In preparing for this address, I went onto the uh, South African Air Freight Forwarders website and I read the following. South encourages the highest level of moral and ethical conduct of its members. As freight forwarders and customs claiming agents, the services provided by members impact greatly on the success or otherwise of their client shipments. Correctly completed declarations and documents, transit times, accurate payments to third parties, and a host of other factors within the international supply chain. To this end, members are required to accept and abide by a code of ethical conduct, to sign a certificate confirming this, and to display prominently a copy of such certificate in the public area of every office where they trade. Fiatas, uh, according to their own website, sets as its main objectives to unite the freight forwarding industry worldwide to represent, promote and protect the interests of the industry by participating as advisors or experts in meetings of international bodies dealing with transportation, to familiarize trade and industry with the public at large with the services rendered by freight forwarders throughout the dissemination of information, distribution of publications, etc., to improve the quality of services rendered by freight forwarders by developing and promoting uniform forwarding document standards trading and standard trading conditions, and to assist with vocational training for freight forwarders, liability insurance problems, tools for electronic commerce, including electronic data interchange and barcodes. As I reflected on these, I agree that these are necessary objectives and standards which the industry should as a minimum uphold. But I would humbly submit that in order to thrive, it is necessary to elevate the internal dialogue beyond the narrow interests of its members to a higher societal purpose. I propose that unless we speak about the common purpose we ultimately serve, we will all struggle to survive in a world that is rapidly changing and in many ways militating against us. The landscape in which we find ourselves has increasingly become complex and challenging. In this address, I cannot fully expand on these, but briefly wish to point out that firstly, our economic growth has a huge dependency on international trade volumes. Um, and, and therefore, our, even our domestic economies has a huge reliance on international trade volumes. World trades, as had been referenced early, continues to struggle with little prospect to change for the next year or two. We have seen slower than expected growth in 2018 due to rising trade tensions and increased economic uncertainty. Generally, economic commentators expect trade volumes to growth to fall even further in 2019. The WTO predicts a 2% decline down from the 3% in 2018. Any growth, however, would be dependent on the easing of the global trade tensions that we are currently experiencing. And sadly, the current tensions invariably hurt the smaller economies. Secondly, technology-driven disruptive innovation has given rise to unprecedented business models and trade value chains, which has introduced significant complexity to cross-border trade flows, and sadly the risks that comes with modernization is characterized by an increase in organized crime and security-related threats. With the proliferation in fraudulent practices such as illicit trade, smuggling, under-invoicing, tariff miscalculation, illicit financial flows to name a few. And then thirdly, factors such as virtual borders, growing trade between connected parties, and questionable morality by intermediaries poses material risks to revenue authorities such as ourselves and have increased exponentially with the increasing threats to the collection of duties and taxes through blatant evasion and aggressive avoidance. 
This also has significant downstream negative implications for the erosion of our domestic economies through the distortion of the integrity of the economic factors for fair competition. The South African government, like other governments, are charged with the challenges of creating the conditions for economic growth and promoting, promoting social development to address the stubborn prevalence of poverty, unemployment and inequality in our society. In this regard, it has to facilitate trade with international partners and countries. At the same time, government has to provide adequate protection of our borders, as well as securing and protecting its citizens from the entry of unsafe and high-risk consumer products, foods and medicines from unscrupulous players around the world. This requires the fine balance between service and trade facilitation on the one hand and stringent enforcement of compliance on the other hand by organizations such as the South African Revenue Service. But we cannot do it alone. We are very clear about this. And collectively, we are either partners or adversaries of each other. We cannot be a hybrid schizophrenia with ambiguity about how we work with one another. And most importantly, to what common purpose we serve. Let me start with SARS. We are clear about our purpose. We serve a higher purpose. SARS exists to enable government to build a democratic state that fosters sustainable economic growth and social development in the interest and well-being of all South Africans. And I might add, all who live in South Africa. Our work has a human face. Given our history, often the face of an African granny taking care of an extended family, the face of a single mother, unemployed, taking care of her children, a little boy or a girl able to go in, to a school in a village, a school, I might add, with a safe toilet where they don't place their life at risk simply by going to the loo. These are the beneficiaries of the work we do. We have a simple approach to our work. We need to balance the forces that interplay continuously in our collective space. We balance the management of our customs mandate to collect taxes whilst facilitating trade across and within our borders to protect our domestic economy from unlawful arbitrage by fraudulent imports. To maintain this balance, we follow three principles of our compliance model. I'll share them with you briefly. Firstly, to provide clarity, certainty, and predictability to stakeholders of their obligations in law. Secondly, to make it easy, simple, and eventually seamless for those who choose to comply, as well as partnering with and placing more reliance on the controls of compliant intermediaries. But equally, thirdly, to create a credible threat of detection and make it hard and costly for those who choose either fraudulently or negligently not to comply. But to achieve the above and maintain the appropriate balance between administering our revenue collection mandate and facilitating trade, we are therefore clear that we need to work together with and through stakeholders such as yourselves in order to strengthen the entire ecosystem. We also accept that we must work hard to gain your confidence and trust as a credible, professional, and ethical tax and customs administration. Our current assessment indicates to us that we have a long way to go to build a credible partnership based on a common purpose and trust, as well as achieving the strategic intent of voluntary compliance within this important value chain we find ourselves. SARS and the local freight forwarding industry have a long history of mutual cooperation that was perhaps best illustrated during the period of 2009 to 2014 during our customs modernization program. And during this time, the interaction then between SARS and the industry was raised beyond simply cooperation to a level of co-creation. During the span of those five years, SARS and its custom stakeholders developed and deployed in rapid succession new technology, technological functionalities 
which have subsequently become embedded within almost every importer's, exporter's, carriers and freight forwarders and customs brokers' uh, IT platforms. These electronic platforms form the nucleus around which customs traders interface with SARS customs today. We have sadly lost some of this momentum during the past five years. We need to reconceptualize this modernization journey since the world has moved on. Emerging disruptive technology-driven innovation compels us to go back to the drawing board. The risk environment, which has also deteriorated significantly, SARS hopes to complete our policy framework for authorized economic operators in place by the end of this financial year and ready to pilot in the new year. Over the longer term, in order to fully implement our compliance model as I referenced before, we need to build deep institutional capability in three important areas. Technology, as your Congress theme suggests, and big data are inescapable realities of our life. Connectivity, with the, whether it is C2C, B2C, B2G, or G2G, is no longer a luxury, but a critical aspect of our future. To the logistics industry, it represents both opportunities but also challenges. As SARS, we are expanding and improving the use of data through third-party data with unquestionable, and I underline unquestionable integrity from all intermediaries. And this will allow us to do better risk profiling, use of machine learning and artificial intelligence, therefore to provide a better accurate case selection methodology to implement higher levels of facilitation for honest taxpayers and traders, to implement a degree of self-regulation for intermediaries, and overall to provide better outcomes for honest brokers, but at the same time to be more visible and to present a credible threat for fraudulent declarations and to impose harsher penalties for those who choose to defraud the system. In this regard, we need to simplify our data requirements and improve our platforms for verifying and exchanging data. We already have various cooperation agreements, agreements with various countries of origin, but have to implement these more diligently. We still find too many examples of information asymmetry between ourselves and our major trading partners like China and India. Valuation remains a key challenge for us, and working hard with our Trade, Industry and Competitions Minister, E.B. Patel, on, in this regard. The extent of blatant invoicing fraud is a significant area of focus for us. It is inconceivable that we are expected to believe that a men's woven, woven suit from China costs 17 rand and 50 cents. That's about just more than a dollar. Or a woman's knitted dress costs 2 rand and 46 cents. That's a few US cents. Equally, that a woman's knitted pajamas from India would cost 10 cents or less than 1 US cent, and a men's suit from India, 7 rand and 67 cents. That's about a half a dollar. In response, we have no option but to be a lot more interventionist than we would like to be, but are left with very little choice. We have well established protocols with other government agencies such as Saab, that's the South African Reserve Bank, and the International Trade Administration Commission, ITAC, for information integration and processing, as well as extending our interconnectivity with neighboring states in our common customs union, working to extend this to SADC and eventually the African Union. These are key developments ahead of the implementation of the free trade agreement. We also need to use, thirdly, secondly, technology to provide digital streamlined services to enhance our services and facilitation role without compromising our revenue collection mandate. Clear goods, this will benefit clear, clearing goods ahead of arrival at the ports of entry, accrediting economic operators who can be trusted, e filing with high levels of automation and fewer manual interventions, cargo management systems with real-time reporting, connected platforms with a single version of the truth across the entire value chain, seamless transition across borders for honest taxpayers and traders, and frustrate traders who seek to defraud the system, deregister them, 
flag them as risk and sanction them. In this regard, trusted ledger applications such as blockchain becomes essential to improve the integrity and outcomes across our value chain. As a member of the World Customs Organization, and signatory to the World Trade Organization Facilitation Agreement, SARS is committed to drive the principles of simplification and harmonization across the value chain in our revitalized modernization journey. The stated benefits estimated to reduce trade costs by over 14% on average and boost global trade by up to $1 trillion per annum. Poor countries in this regard are the biggest winners. And if we don't do it, the biggest losers. We are also ready as a member of the WCO to accept the challenges adopted by the WO Council, namely the customs in the 21st century, which has set our 10 building blocks with a, with, of which a globally networked customs is central. Unless we achieve the objectives of closer real-time connectivity between customs authority as well as businesses and intermediaries, towards a system with integrity and lawful trade, we continue the race to the bottom, where the only winners will be the thugs and the thieves who fleece the system at the expense of honest operators and eventually the poor and the most vulnerable in society. This month, in SARS, we are piloting a new Mobi app to enhance customs case management for customs officers across all inspection types whether it's manual or systems-based, and to allow better tracking for our clients. Thirdly, we need to work harder to develop our staffing model and upskill our staff to the future world of work. As we build a more enabling technology platform, as well as expanding and improving the use of data, artificial intelligence, predictive analytics, and machine learning, the work of our own employees will evolve and they will engage in more strategic and analytical knowledge work in the areas of valuation, risk profiling, analytics, and investigative work, and to higher service orientation to facilitate trade without compromising our mandate. And very, very importantly, to be professional, ethical, and incorruptible officers at our ports of entry. We make the firm pronouncement that any party who seek to collude with our customs officials will find themselves on the wrong side of the law and face the direst consequences. We will not tolerate collusion of any kind. Allow me to share an anecdote of what you find that characterizes the compliance culture we see. Our compliance rates for reporting on the RCG, the reporting of conveyances and goods, is really weak. This is the system for sharing third-party corroborating data from intermediaries in the logistics supply chain including shipping lines, airlines, and freight forwarders. We record a matching rate to customs declarations of 53% for sea cargo and 24% for air cargo. I'm informed that sea and air, we are seeing some improvement, but freight forwarders are lagging behind in this regard. We are now considering either to stop all mismatched consignments <clears throat> in order to force compliance, the more acceptable alternative is penalty provisions commencing in December this year. We would prefer, however, higher levels of compliance and a greater ability to serve you. We recognize that the implement of the new Customs Act program is more complex than originally thought. Many of you have expressed concerns specifically in relation to registration, licensing, and accreditation. We would like to express our commitment to simplify this currently manual and tedious process as part of our focus over the next 6 to 12 months. We hope to launch a restricted pilot during the last quarter of this financial year. We would urge you in the meantime to improve the levels of compliance with your own submissions of cargo reports of conveyances and goods. What is my key message for you today? Our aim must be to strengthen the entire ecosystem and the move of trade and the movement of goods. The ongoing pursuit, each of our narrow interests, often mindlessly in pursuit of our own bottom line, we will simply increase the burden of compliance for all of us and continue to erode value for all stakeholders across the value chain in the long run. The time has come for a greater sense of stewardship. 
organizations such as SAF and FIATA have an important leadership role to play in this regard. I encourage you to reflect on the philosophical principle that indeed, as we focus on our collective good and common destiny, we invariably act in our own best interest. Let's never forget the human faces behind the work we do. SARS remains committed to serve this higher purpose. And we invite all stakeholders to join us in this quest. For stakeholders active in the trade environment that will be fundamentally reshaped by emerging complexities, it is important to take advantage of the opportunities as well as addressing the challenges inherent in the area of customs and trade connectivity. Technology, with all its potential, can only serve the purpose we define for it. And let's make sure we define a higher purpose. There is no reason why SARS and the freight forwarding industry represented locally by SAF cannot embark on a new round of collaboration that is focused on increased connectivity and the use of digital technologies, applying the same co-creation approach that worked so well for us before, and in the interest ultimately of economic growth and the reduction of poverty, both domestically and for the region. I invite you to work with us in embracing this common purpose and to achieve this dream, not only to build better businesses, but to stewards of this industry to substantively contribute to a better and healthy societies. Thank you very much. I wish you well for the, for the next few days of your time. token of appreciation from the FIATA Congress and thank you so much for your address this morning. <laughs> and thank you very much to the Commissioner of the South African Revenue Services this morning for his keynote address uh, to us. I think we can all agree that perhaps the, the greatest difficulty we all face, whether we're in business, in various sectors of trades, or represent institutions today, is finding that very, very delicate balance of where regulation and compliance, together with all of the volatility and change that technology and different ways of doing things, as well as new market access angles, accesses, also begin to bring us um, in every single sector. But as the Commissioner reminded us this morning, it is our problem. It is also up to us to be part of the solutions and ensure that we are indeed all hands on deck in making sure that what we do begins to also reflect upon the type of societies we want to build and the type of relations, particularly related to inclusive growth right the way around the world. And you and I, ladies and gentlemen, have a role to play in that value chain as well. Ladies and gentlemen, to now also give us a few words this morning is one of the members of Parliament right here in South Africa, Mr. Jordan Hill Lewis. Today he serves not only as a member of our Parliament, but he also serves as the Shadow Minister of Finance within South Africa's um, Parliament, which is based here in Cape Town. An interesting fact about him. He, in 2011, at the very tender age of 24, became South Africa's youngest member of parliament. So as we begin to speak about how young people in particular begin to influence policy, technology, and of course the direction in which so many sectors and different tables um, in leadership around the world begin to evolve, he is indeed perhaps one of those who have actively taken that position and continue of course to make sure that the voice of young people are heard right the way throughout the halls of leadership in South Africa today. Please give him a very warm round of applause. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is a real pleasure to be here with you today, and I just want to add my own uh, voice of welcome to you, to Cape Town and to South Africa. Welcome, Wam Kilikile, Saubona, Masharona. Hey, Tara. Uh, 
is wonderful to have you here. And uh, I hope, you know, every conference starts with a welcome. But I do want to say that I really hope that you feel the warmth of our welcome because it really is uh, a privilege to host your conference here and to host all of you and your families in our country. And I thought that this was a very serious conference, but when I took a look at the conference program, I saw that you played golf yesterday and you are going on a cooking tour tomorrow of the Boerkarp, which will be very delicious, and you are going on a wine tour and you are going on a wildlife tour. So now I see why this conference is so oversubscribed and why you're all very keen to be here. But I hope that you enjoy your time in Cape Town and that you do feel the warmth of our, of our country and our city. Uh, we are pleased to have you here. Let me also say to uh, Mr. President, Adat, thank you for the work that you do and your, and your international executive of FIATA and for your words this morning. And to our local executive, Basil Peterson, Mr. Logan, and your team, it's been a pleasure to work with you over the last few years uh, in the very important work that you do, and thank you for the work that you did to put this conference together. I know that it wasn't easy. And also to the Cape branch, Mr. Basil Hannibal, who I haven't seen here today yet, but I'm sure he's here, and his executive. Where's Basil? There you go. Hello. We've got two Basils running the show in South Africa. It's Basil Squared. Um, and thank you to your team and your executive as well. Uh, now, all of the previous speakers have said something about the very strange times that we live in for global trade. And although my job today is, is merely to welcome you uh, on behalf of the government, uh, I do want to say a word or two about what we are trying to do in South Africa and what I think FIATA's role can be in helping us do that. It is really uh, strange, it is, it is very weird times that we are living through when the, the forces for uh, global trade isolationism <laughs> Are, and higher barriers are uh, America and Britain. And the forces for uh, greater global trade are uh, China. That is one of the ironies of the time that we live in. But beyond the personalities involved, uh, there are some very interesting and unique personalities involved in this global dispute. But our responsibility is to unashamedly make the case for why freer and more open trade is better for everyone and particularly the poorest of the poor in the global third and developing world. Uh, and to make policy based on evidence. And the evidence in this, as I'm sure we all know, is, is really quite unquestionable and overwhelming. The, Previous decades of, of more open trade have yielded the greatest increase in uh, well-being for our common society across the globe, probably more so than any other time in, in human history. Uh, and that is as a result of a deliberate effort to make it easier to integrate supply chains around the world and to make it easier for trade to happen. And for the role that you have played in that over the pre preceding decades, you should be very proud. And you should also, as your president has said this morning, be moved uh, to protect that progress for our common society and to make the case for it very uh, unashamedly and strongly. And to tell the successful stories of trade. Of course, one of the biggest problems with, with freer and more open trade around the world is that it is very easy to spot those people who, uh, who may regard themselves as having lost out uh, to, the, to the global trade equation. It is much more difficult, much harder, to point to the many families and individuals and communities across the globe who have benefited. And so while the Global trade statistics and income and well-being statistics tell a very clear story, it's harder to point to the individuals. But my constituency as a member of parliament is a small town about 
uh, five hours drive from here in a place called George, uh, which is a predominantly a farming community. And I was there yesterday, I spent the last three days there, and quite by chance I had a meeting with some local farmers yesterday, which prepared me perfectly with an anecdote for why the work that you do in this conference is so important for our country uh, and for the world. I met a group of blueberry farmers yesterday whose business has expanded tremendously over the last few years and now employs 120 people in a part of the country uh, that, like so many parts of South Africa, uh, where unemployment and, and inequality is very high. But the fascinating part of that discussion was that the customers for those berries are not South Africans uh, shopping uh, here in Cape Town or in Santon in Johannesburg. The biggest customer for this particular farmer was a, uh, a place which the farmer described to me as a small town in China of three million people. Uh, and he, this, this particular farmer, cannot keep up with the demand of, uh, for blueberries uh, around the world. And so he's expanding and investing and growing his business. Uh, and it is, it is doubling in size almost every year. Now that is a wonderful story of how uh, the people who facilitate that trade in this room and your colleagues around the world have directly yielded the employment of 120 people in a tiny town in uh, the garden route of South Africa. Probably most uh, blueberry eaters in China have never heard of that place. And yet that is where the product is coming from. That is the beauty of free and open global trade. And that is something that's worth defending. And uh, that is a story that's, that we need to hear more of. Now, let me just say briefly what we are engaged with here in South Africa. What is our current national project? And the Commissioner said something about this, uh, and, and I'll underscore a little bit of what he has said. We are a, essentially a country of enormous potential, enormous uh, wealth of natural resources and natural beauty, but we have all of us are perturbed and disturbed and uncomfortable by the very serious problem of poverty that we, that we face and unemployment and, and inequality. And all of us are committed to a common national project of making sure that we can grow our economy fast enough to include the many millions of people who, uh, who the Commissioner referred to the the rural granny who is using a social grant to look after uh, her family and the many millions of urban unemployed South Africans. Now, I come from a different political party to that of the President. Uh, I'm a member of the official oppos opposition, as you heard. But that does not mean that all of us, each one of us, are just as passionate and just as committed to this national project and inspired by the commitment that our president has shown to making it easier to do business in South Africa and easier to trade with South Africa and the Commissioner said some things about that this morning but firstly we have got to focus on African trade a concerning statistic is that only 10 percent of the trade that South Africa does is with African countries. A full 90% of our trade is with the rest of the world. Now, we hear uh, lots of anecdotal evidence of the enormous difficulty that South African companies face in moving goods across borders to our neighbors and further north on the continent. And so we're extremely excited by the prospect of a continental free trade agreement uh, and I am uh, doing what work I am able to do in our national parliament to try and push that process as fast as possible. But we've got to focus on easier, faster uh, African trade. 
One of our largest local exporters to the continent, a retail group called ShopRite, recently said that it takes about a thousand pieces of paper and about 190 US dollars to move one truck of goods from South Africa to Angola. Now that, under those conditions, it will be extremely difficult to expand trade, and so that is why we are so uh, concerned with reducing that friction. Secondly, we must meet our uh, Bali uh, Trade Facilitation Agreement commitments, WTO commitments, and make faster progress in doing so. And that is something that I uh, am looking at very carefully uh, in my role uh, with SARS in, in, in Parliament. SARS being the South African Revenue Service. Sorry, I, I don't mean to use that, that term that you may not be familiar with. And third and most importantly, the President has said that we are going to make sure that we go up the global rankings in the World Bank's ease of doing business uh, rankings. Now, it is a source of great concern and a regret that over the course of the last eight years, we have dropped from a high point of 38th in the world on that ranking for ease of doing business to our current position of 89th. Now, uh, I follow that ranking very closely. I read it in depth. It is a, it is a very rigorous analysis conducted by the World Bank and, and uh, a very credible analysis. And the President has said that we must urgently take action to move into the top 50 and hopefully get back to uh, where we were in the top 30 or top 35. But also the World Bank has recently introduced a concept called distance to the frontier. And what that basically means is they, they don't only say where your country currently is, but they also describe what global best practice is, and that's what they call the frontier. What are those countries doing that are ranked right at the top of that ranking? And so we have set ourselves the ambition in the city of Cape Town and in the Western Cape government uh, here in this province, not just to be part of the global average on that ranking, but to try to work to get closer to the very frontier of that ranking and to make this the easiest place to do business in all of Africa. And that is our ambition, and we are working very hard uh, day and night to get that right, in conjunction with organizations like SAF, who play a critical role in identifying uh, for us where the unnecessary red tape and, uh, and friction in the system is. So much of the compliance burden uh, was written, as the Commissioner has, has said quite eloquently, was, was written at a time pre uh, the technological revolution and really does need to be updated for what modern technology allows us to do to make that easier. And so I, I'm extremely passionate about the ability of freer, more open trade to to lift people out of poverty around the world, to get people into the global economy, and to improve the living conditions and living standards of, uh, of the poor. If that, is our, if that is our overriding objective, then all I can do is to thank you for the work that you're doing in making that possible, and to egg you on to say, please do more of it, Please push harder to make our governments more efficient, to make trade easier. Please play a vocal role in telling us where we can improve. Uh, and please, as I said, make the case unashamedly and with confidence and with strength and with the human stories for how your uh, vocation, for how your profession and for how your business improves the world because that is a very honorable thing. So thank you, I wish you good luck for your conference, and I hope that you enjoy our city, and I have no, no doubt that now that you have experienced it, you will be back. Thank you. You make your way away from the stage, Jordan.
City Siaboga from the Theater Congress um, and their representatives today. All right, uh, thank you very much um, for those words of welcome, but also those words that continue to frame the reference for which we are gathered here, ladies and gentlemen. If I can now invite to the stage um, Mr. Yawood, I can't see him, there he is, there we go, um, who today will showcase some of the work that the Yifi Awards have been up to, will introduce us uh, to our finalists and of course will award these very important awards for us here this morning. Please give Michael and his team a very warm round of applause. Good morning. Uh, Mr. President, the FIATA Presidency, Host Association, the South African Association of Freight Forwarders, guests of honour, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honour to be here with you in the wonderful city of Cape Town this morning. Now in its 21st year, FIATA's Young International Freight Forwarder of the Year Award continues to demonstrate recognition by FIATA and the TT Club of the need to develop young, talented individuals in the industry and to reward them with unique experiences and valuable training opportunities. We're delighted as TT Club to continue partnering FIATA through the sponsorship of this valuable award. TT Club has been a primary sponsor of the award since its inception in 1999, and as an insurance provider specialising in the logistics sector, we firmly believe in the importance of investment in the training and development of the young individuals within this industry. For the overall winning candidates, the award principally consists of both practical and academic training opportunities, including a week based in one of the TT Club's regional offices in either London, Hong Kong or New Jersey, plus attendance at a further one week long training course run in our head office in London. We hope that the overall winner of the award who comes to our offices for the training will return to their employers with a greater appreciation of the nature of risk and insurance and the importance of managing both effectively. In addition, one year's free subscription to the International Transport Journal of Switzerland is also provided to the, to the four regional winners. We're extremely proud to have been able to continue our sponsorship of this prestigious award, and it's with great pleasure that we are able to celebrate the four regional finalists and the 21st overall Young International Freight Forwarder of the Year during the Congress this week. The steering committee were really pleased this year with the number of um, candidates having been submitted to the competition from all four geographical regions. So to all of those associations who actively encourage your members to submit candidates to the, to the award, we greatly thank you. We're constantly reviewing opportunities to promote the award and to increase participation year on year. And to this end, have developed three social media network sites across LinkedIn, Twitter and Facebook which I would encourage you all to join, as well as creating and developing two dedicated web pages on both the FIATA and TT Club websites. Encouragingly, the award continues to be an appealing, rewarding challenge to the candidates, and one which allows those candidates the ability to demonstrate and develop their knowledge of the industry. The award strives to provide a level playing field for all candidates, whether they work for a small customs broker or a multinational, multifunctional operator. So this year, the candidate was set the challenging task of writing a 6,000 word dissertation based on a multimodal movement of cargo concerning a key import and a key export for their country of origin. With extra marks available based upon the complexity of the cargo, modes of transport used, the routing, regulatory issues and other cross-border issues such as customs. This year's entries were again of a very high standard and featured a real spread of topics which included cotton, giant generators, baby formula, textiles, lithium-ion batteries, elephants and a submarine, all of which exhibit the true diversity of this industry. As you can imagine, with a range of cargoes covered such as these, the candidates were afforded the opportunity to address many of the challenges that US freight forwarders see on a day-to-day -day basis. Following the success of last year, um, during the opening ceremony this morning, we're going to invite all four regional finalists up onto stage and present them with a certificate and their trophy. We will then announce the overall winner of the international uh, competition during the gala dinner on Friday evening, later in the week. 
So without further ado, I'd like to take the opportunity to welcome the regional finalists onto stage to collect their trophies and certificates. Could I please invite um, President uh, Barbara Barat and the Chairman of ABVT, Thomas Sim, to join me on stage? So first of all, from Africa and Middle East region, representing the Shipping and Forwarding Agents Association of Zimbabwe, is Mr. Inos Chapara. Asia Pacific region representing Customs Brokers and Freight Forwarders Federation of New Zealand, Mr. Philip Burgess. European region representing Russian Association of Freight Forward and Logistics, Ms. Ivinia Kokova. Finally, from the Americas region, representing the Canadian International Freight Forwarders Association, Mrs. Rachel Van Hamalen. Regional finalists will be present through the Congress this week, um, and as mentioned, the overall winner of the award will be announced during the gala dinner on Friday evening. Um, so, just to part, please join me in congratulating all four of our 2018 regional winners. should also go to uh, TT Club. And uh, Michael, where are you? Yeah, thank you. We spoke earlier about uh, partnerships and uh, you know, collaborating, etc. And I think if there's uh, one international group that has really collaborated with FIATA over the many, many years, that, that is the TT Club. Not only have they collaborated with Fiata, but they've also they also understand the, the importance of, of of creating this next generation. And what Michael and, and his team does is admirable, and uh, we need to applaud him for that. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. I think to the 
the young people, to the young people who actually take the time, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, at that age it's probably better to, to be out on a Friday night and, uh, and have a great party somewhere. But to be there and do dissertations and do all sorts of paperwork, etc., and uh, to understand this, uh, that's, that's really a sacrifice when you are that age that you make. And to you, I need to take my head off to you and say, congratulations, you're already winners. Uh, you know, uh, the gala dinner winner, yes, that's one thing, but you are, each one of you, are winners in your own right. So congratulations to you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. But thank you very much uh, to Mr. Michael Yarwood of the TT Club. And of course, congratulations um, to our finalists and our award recipients this morning. Let's give them a big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. And ladies and gentlemen, we will now take a short tea break. <laughs>